Here we are. It's the 20th of March. We passed the Ides of March, which was momentous in itself. And of course, the context is um, we're here all pretty much locked down and trying to stay safe in the grip of this uh, coronavirus pandemic. So it's um, an unprecedented time, I think, for many people here. Um, and we've never really seen the economy come to practically a stop. Uh, so uh, we're, we're all trying to kind of adjust to what that really means. Um, so I thought, Sally, maybe if you introduce yourself briefly, and then I'll do the same, and then we can get started on our chat. Of course, Rita. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, I'm Sally Helgeson. I'm an author, a speaker, and a leadership coach. And for 30 years, I've focused primarily on women's leadership and building more inclusive organizations, both in my writing and my work. Uh, so I have lots of thoughts and insights about what kind of time that this is for women leaders uh, and for organizations in terms of building the opportunities here to build more inclusive cultures in a time of, of great stress. So wonderful to be here and thank you, Rita. Oh, thank you for making the time. It's always, it's always a pleasure. Uh, so I'm Rita McGrath. I'm a professor at Columbia Business School, and my main areas of focus are at the intersection between strategy and innovation. But a little kind of side project of mine, which Sally was hugely influential in shaping, uh, is that I direct our executive leadership program for women. It's called Women in Leadership. Uh, and it's really about two things. One is how can women be their own best advocates, change what, they're, what is in their control, but more importantly, how can they be change agents for their organizations to make the organizations more uh, inclusive and more open to the influence of women, which a mountain of research suggests is absolutely critical to high performance, that, that when women are not just in the room, but actually listened to and are able to participate. Yeah that it makes such a, a huge difference. So I thought to, to kick things off, Sally, um, you said something to me that just really struck with, stuck with me and it even made it into my most recent book, which is about strategic inflection yeah. points, which is, you, you know, you've been studying women's leadership for, forever, um, but what we've traditionally thought of as women's leadership we're now recognizing is really important for leaders in general. So I'd, I'd love it if you could maybe expand on that thought. It's been a fascinating process to watch, Rita, over the last 30 years as um, demographics, technology, and the nature of the economy, the emphasis on knowledge and innovation have changed what our understanding is of what constitutes excellence in leadership. Uh, and now organizations that are well run or ahead of the curve are all looking for leaders who can inspire trust, uh, facilitate engagement of employees so that they can really bring their hearts and minds and innovative skills, uh, qualities like listening and empathy and the ability to directly and clearly communicate with people have become ever more important. Um, and just the recognition that uh, an inclusive culture is required to manage a diverse workforce, which is the reality. You know, diversity and inclusion have gotten paired, but, but in, diversity is really the reality of our workforce and inclusion is the, the means by which it can be led. So what's been fascinating, um, I wrote a book in 1990 called The Female Advantage, Women's I Ways. Have, right over here in my library. <laughs> And, um, and sort of enumerated, looked at these skills as representing women's leadership at its best. Mm -hmm. And at the time, that was always dismissed as those are soft skills. Those aren't leadership skills. And today, um, you know, what, ha what were formerly seen as soft skills have become leadership skills. And I think we've underplayed the role that women have played in this in terms of shifting the strategy of how organizations um, motivate and engage uh, their employees and innovate in the world. So it's been a fascinating thing to watch. My old friend Tom Peters always says, what was hard has become soft and what was soft has become hard. And I think that's uh, the, really, the realization of this, that the soft skills are really the hard skills and they're the ones that organizations need now and will need more than ever going forward. 
Yeah, and I, I see that uh, everywhere. Um, one of the most interesting um, bits of recent work uh, is a book with a very provocative title, Why So Many Incompetent Men. Have you, have you run across that one? Oh, yeah, that book is a fascinating book. <laughs> I was asked to write a foreword for it, and I was like, you know, I'm not really sure I'm ready to go there. But he, um, um, the, 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 the author makes a fascinating point, which is that when it comes to leadership, um, that we tend to confuse confidence with competence. And that very often women are quite happy to be softly, quietly, unglamorously competent. And they don't go you know, yelling to the skies about it and they don't promote themselves so much about it. Um, and I was wondering, uh, you know, is there any prospect that that could change, do you think? I think, you know, one thing I noticed, and, and I'm fascinated by the role of crisis in how our uh, definitions of leadership evolve, but in 2008, um, I was at a huge conference in Dobiel, a big women's conference, and the consensus of the women was, these guys have been telling us that we had no idea what we were doing, and look what they've done. So it was, and I think that part of that irrational exuberance uh, that preceded 2008 was really a consequence of overconfidence. One of the great points that uh, the author Tommaso uh, Pre Music Tomorrow makes in that book that you cite is that the biggest leadership problem in organizations is that they have no idea how to spot overconfidence mm -hmm. in men. That they believe that extreme confidence means that you know, he can get the job done. And, and no matter how many times we see overconfident, it's not confident men that are the problem, it's overconfident men mm -hmm. that are the problem. But how many times we've seen them fail, organizations still get fooled. So I think it's very interesting because over the last few years, there's been a big push. You know, what women need is more confidence. Um, you know, we have to build that up, confidence curve and things like that. It's been a lot of talk about that. But I think that what really is needed above all and the big lesson for women from this book is that what we need to do is to be better at articulating and understanding the nature of our con competence so that we can convey it clearly. It's not self-promotion, it's what your organization really needs to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the Women in Leadership course, we spend a chunk of time trying to get people to really own their own capability, which is, is a real challenge. You know, women almost feel like I get the impression that they feel, oh, gee, you know, if I if I if I say how great I am or what I accomplished, that that's going to be seen as being promotional or being, um, you know, yeah, I'm going to get pushed down for it or something. Um, and yet, uh, I don't think that's the case at all. I had a, a wonderful incident with our daughter, um, in which somebody was asking me about something, and I said, oh yeah, I could do that. And she looked at me with these big round eyes and she said, mom, you said that you could just do that. And I was like, well, yeah, I've done it about 10,000 times. Why would I not be able to do it now? <laughs> <laughs> but to her at the time, I think she was 22. To her 22 year old self, that sounded sort of out of, out of character for a woman to say confidently, I can do that. Uh, so that, I thought that was very interesting. Um, so what, um, I mean, we're in this crisis. It, yeah. It's unfolding day by day. Um, it's causing us, I think, to revisit a lot of the taken for granted assumptions that we've built relationships on, that we've built organizations on. Um, what, what do you think are some of the things that are likely to change as we rethink how we built what we have today? Well, I, I really think that, um, you know, what I hear from people, and I'm communicating with people all over the world very broadly on almost a full-time basis. <laughs> since <laughs> We're all living on Zoom now. <laughs> the work I had disappeared, but um, it all involves, my work involves travel, so I'm home and I'm communicating with people on a full-time basis, and it's pretty fascinating. And what I'm hearing from the people um, in order to um, maintain resilience and some degree of hope, uh, during this crisis is we need to appreciate what we have. We need to appreciate and actively connect with the people we know 
broadly, we can get through this together. And I think that's going to create even more pressure for organizations to build cultures that people perceive to be inclusive. I work with organizations that will say, we're putting into place inclusive you know, policies and in inclusion is perceived by people and usually perceived because of leadership behaviors that then get translated down. So I think there may be less tolerance or more notice of behaviors that are not inclusive. So I think there's going to be a pressure on that. Now, as always in a crisis, there's going to be a backlash to that. And no, we've lost so much money. We've got to do X, Y, and Z. And let's, you know, focus on the bottom line first. But I think that people's expectations of that um, will be will be different. And uh, there'll be more 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 requirement that if you want to engage me the other thing i'm seeing is i'm seeing so much improvisation mm -hmm. i watched a segment um the other night on uh two nurses who had figured out how to make one ventilator mask serve four people and they made a youtube video and put it out there to try to teach other healthcare workers how to do that so the that level of improvisation on the front lines, which is where successful improvisation usually takes place, will also drive a demand for inclusive, um, uh, not just structures, but behaviors in organizations and recognition um, that the people on the front lines have so much embedded knowledge. How do we begin to translate that back into what we offer in the marketplace? Well, and this gets back to the leadership theme. Um, I mean, one of the things that I found with, with the research for um, my, my most recent book, which was about how organizations can anticipate and address strategic inflection points. So it's like, how do you see them? How do you decide what to do about them? And then how do you uh, bring the organization with you? But one of the things that came across very clearly in that book was the, the messages that things are changing take place at the edges of your organization. You know, they don't sort of present themselves in a neat package at the conference table at headquarters. Um, and so how do you hear, you know, those kinds of improvisation, those kinds of signals that things are, are really changing? A um, couple of the other assumptions that I think we're going to have to start rethinking are, um, I mean, take the age old complaint about women being interrupted or a woman has an idea and a man says the same thing five minutes later and it's received wisdom. And one of the interesting issues that I've been kind of noodling about is if we're doing this kind of communicating, you know, and it's intermediated or it's moderated or everybody's got to take a turn, that sort of behavior is going to be much less prevalent because we've got now this this intervening infrastructure which basically says if i talk over you nobody can hear or if the moderator doesn't give everybody airtime it's it's not going to be a successful meeting and i wonder if this kind of um hmm. communication style if you will is going to seep back into when we eventually hopefully turn back to face-to-face -face communications i wonder if it'll have a lasting impact there uh, that's something really interesting I hadn't thought about, that more uh, that it, it may change our patterns of communication. We're getting more accustomed to uh, communicating in forums like this uh, online in a way and, and exactly the protocols of not, you know, mute yourself when you're not talking. And how does, how's that going to translate um, going forward into practices of, you know, old fashioned practices such as courtesy and listening. Uh, I think that, that there's, there's a, a chance that it's not just that organizations will spontaneously say, oh, we need to get better at listening. And, you know, they say that already. And then are they, are they not? Sometimes they are. It often depends on the leader behavior, but that there will be, you know, less tolerance for it among talented employees who will push for something else because they've seen the efficacy of more inclusive ways of uh, and protocols for communicating. Mm -hmm. So I think that there will be some changes in those protocols and it will be all to the good. Mm -hmm. So you were telling me this morning you were on a call and one of the participants was Francis Hesselbein. 
Yes. Um, and I know she figured very prominently in some of your early work. What were sort of three or four things about her leadership style that really struck you at, at that point? You know, uh, one of the incidents, and, and I, I called up Francis out of the blue after um, I read a, a cover story that Peter Drucker had written in the old conference board magazine, uh, talking about how he thought she was uh, as good as any leader in the world, and he was recommending her to run General Motors. She was at that time National Executive Director of the Girl Scouts. Mm -hmm. And Frances, um, one of the things that struck me about Frances, too, she, I remember she had a meeting with the, a phone meeting with the New York Times with some controversy over Girl Scout cookies. And you know what she did in preparing for that? She not only prepared herself, but she brought in about six or seven uh, uh, staffers, some of them at quite low levels, who were in various departments, communications, but other ones as well. Because what she was saying to them this is how you handle an important call with the New York Times. So I thought it was so interesting because often younger staffers in organizations get no chance to actually see how their senior leaders, or in this case, their CEO, handle uh, complicated calls. So that to me was such an inclusive kind of behavior. I remember also sitting in a meeting with her and two of her direct reports, members of her web of inclusion, that first circle, uh, were squabbling about something and they turned to her and said, you know, what do you think? And she said, what I think is that you need to schedule some off time and resolve this among yourself, yourselves. I know you can do that and then you'll come back and, and let me know what you came up with. So this, this trust that they could do this and this unwillingness to micromanage or step in, uh, you know, or be with what our uh, colleague Michael Bungay Stanier calls an advice monster was very <laughs> impressive to me. And I was able to see demonstrated um, after that interview with, with Francis, I wrote the book, The Web of Inclusion. It was really based on the observation of her leadership style. And you've talked about her creating these um, circles. Could, could yes. you elaborate right. on that? Because I think it's such an interesting concept because we've got, I mean, what I observe today is companies have gotten very lean, you know, spans of control have gotten very, very wide. Um, and a lot of younger leaders, you know, that you, we used to have a system of trainer jobs, right? So you ran a department and then maybe you ran a division and then maybe you ran a country and then maybe, and you know, you sort of learned leadership in a low, low risk, low cost yeah. way. And what I'm seeing today is that people are being put in roles that they're just not prepared for. And there, there's been no kind of training concept. And yet I think with this idea of, of, of increasing circles of, of, of um, I don't know what you want to call it, cir circles of organization, uh, that that may be a way of addressing some of these challenges. I think that that's very true. I mean, when I first uh, studied Frances and did, I shadowed her. That's, that's the method I used. Um, and when I first did that, uh, organizations were organized in a very hierarchical way, top down, with communication up and down a chain of command. We didn't have uh, the technology we have now. And... Um, and leaders communicated in a very isolated way. So it was fascinating to watch her and what she laid out for me. And I remember we were having lunch at the Cosmopolitan Club in New York, and she was trying to describe her organization to me. So she started pulling knives and forks and salt and pepper shakers and everything and showing me that what she really had was a web. And she said, I'm in the center, I'm not the top. She said, I draw people in around me and I, organize the people in the orbit so that they can learn from one another and that I can be their support. And what was so, it was fascinating to see that, especially watching how our cultures and our organizational cultures evolved. 
or you don't have all that training. So you do need to see how people do things do things. You do need that access to be able to witness how excellence is demonstrated at a leadership level, which hierarchical organizations didn't provide. Mm -hmm. And also, so much of our work now is done in teams. And I think a webs of inclusion, both as a structure, which it was, but also as a practice. A web of inclusion is based on an inclusive practice and inclusive behaviors such as she demonstrated mm -hmm. that 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 really is where uh, the team coordination can come in and where um, you know how you manage teams you really manage teams by giving them support and then getting out of their way <laughs> and I think one of the interesting things about the current crisis is that we've almost got no choice, right? I mean, you can't be command and control in, in this sort of dispersed multinodal uh, existence we're all sort of sharing. I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about your most recent book. So it's been out for a year? Two years next week. Wow. Oh, it feels as though it was just yesterday. I know. That's <laughs> amazing. So the book, for those of you that don't know, is called How Women Rise. And in the book, you're very specific about things that women do that hold themselves back yeah. and how we can get past those things. And I think it would be just wonderful if you wouldn't mind recapping a few of those um, bits of advice for our listeners. Sure. How Women Rise, is, which I wrote, co-authored with Marshall Goldsmith, uh, is very much about the habits and behaviors most likely to get in women's ways as they seek to move to a higher level in their organizations. Um, and I think the ones, you know, we have 12 habits or behaviors in that book, and we talk about how you can address them. I think the ones that have gotten the most um, response from people have been reluctance to claim your achievements, mm -hmm. expecting others to notice and value your contributions, putting your job before your career, and the perfection trap, the, the getting caught up in trying to be perfect. We found that organizations, in fact, tend to reward women for being precise and correct and promote them on that basis. But that's not what senior leadership teams are looking for precision and correctness. They're looking for strategic thinking, for uh, big picture thinking, for vision, uh, and for connections and visibility. So those things, those four of the 12 that I've elaborated there, they often work very much together. And um, you were talking earlier, that example about your daughter was, was fascinating to me. Because what I find is that, you know, a question I get so often when I'm talking about reluctance to um, claim your achievements and expecting others to spontaneously notice and value your contributions is women will say, well, you know, how can I talk about what I've contributed um, but make sure that nobody thinks I'm, I come off as arrogant and, or that I'm sort of an all about me person or I appear too, too confident. So what, what I see from that question is the extent to which many women still feel that proactively managing everybody else's expectations or impression of them is in fact more important than being able to provide information, here's what I've done, and here's what I can do. This is what I'm capable of. That's the information your organization and your leadership needs. Um, so you don't need to proactively manage that. And, and one of the interesting things I've learned being in this a long time is that people also change their mind. When I was, before I came in this field, I was um, in corporate communications. And I remember once as a very young staffer uh, being in a meeting with a lot of senior guys and there was a topic and I, I, I shared my opinion. And as we were leaving, one of the senior guys came up to me and said, boy, you sure aren't afraid to share your opinion. You know, basically saying you are inappropriate, not a line. Hmm. And I don't know what got into me, but I just said, no, I'm not. I didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, was I inappropriate? And I didn't say, yes, I have a perfect right to. I just said, no, I'm not. And you know, about a month later, I heard him talking to a colleague in another room. 
And he said, you know what I like about Sally is, um, is she's not afraid to speak her mind. So I gave him a chance to get used to it. Uh -huh. So we need to stop being that involved in proactively being terrified. Anyone, anywhere might think we're overconfident. That's what you were demonstrating to your daughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think uh, it, 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 I want to just pick up on this notion of, of saying you're sorry. Um, because that's the work I'm giving to a lot of women, um, just all across age groups, all across activities that, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's like, it's like a reflex almost. And uh, one of the um, guest speakers in, in our course uh, is a wonderful woman named uh, Jennifer Witter. Um, and she has a whole sort of spiel she does on do not be sorry for breathing, do not be sorry for taking up space, do not be sorry for having a point of view. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't help. Like, it, you know, there is no positive thing that comes out of saying you're sorry a thousand times a day. It just doesn't matter. <laughs> so like if people could take it. It undercuts your sincerity with the occasional things that you really do need to be sorry about. Well, right. You know, I mean, you know, okay. So if I really screwed up, then I should yeah. be sorry. You know, yeah. but I shouldn't be sorry for existing. <laughs> you know? Well, those are two of the two communication behaviors and how women rise are minimizing, and mm -hmm. sorry is a way of minimizing. It's basically saying, as you note, I'm sorry, I'm here. You know, you open the door to a meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. Why? For your existence, it's ridiculous. And the other is too much, too much information, too much background, too much detail, too much here's how I got to this thinking. So they, they really, what's been fascinating is to watch the extent to which they, they work together and they both, they both exemplify a feeling or a need to apologize that you're part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are you seeing evidence that and I'm thinking, I mean, one of the things I've long sort of pondered is um, if I look at my daughter's generation, right? I mean, this is a group of young women who, you know, they grew up playing sports. They grew up being allowed to compete. They grew up with Title IX. They grew up doing travel soccer and, and being competitive and learning that, you know, you can compete and win and be friends afterwards, <laughs> you know? And I wonder if you're seeing any, any generational sort of shift in the zeitgeist almost. Um, of, uh, of, you know, how, how people are being willing to so accept women on those terms. Yes, I agree with you. I think that in my observation, uh, the younger generation of women comes to a place of confidence in their own competence and an acceptance of their right to be there earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than my generation or that bridge generation of women now in their you know, late 40s, early 50s, um, they come to it earlier. They have communication uh, issues that get in their way, often apologizing, minimizing, and some of the speech habits of that generation don't necessarily serve them well. But those are small. Those aren't fundamental characterological uh, inhibitions of that betray your feeling that you don't have a right to belong there or feeling that anything you do is going to be um, viewed through such a punitive lens that it's going to impact all women everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's a very, very uh, positive thing and that we will make more rapid progress. And it's why I've remained very optimistic about the direction of women's leadership. Um, even though people say, oh, I can't believe it's 2020. We're still having these conversations. I can. This is a big social change. This is a, a, a massive change. Um, and it's going to take time. But I think I've watched so many positive things. I've watched skills that were dismissed as soft skills become seen as the most essential leadership skills today. That's a big deal. Um, and I've seen women become confident earlier and earlier, which is uh, extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It is. My husband and I were recently in Nashville um, yeah. before yeah. the tornadoes <laughs> and before the current situation. Oh. Um, and one of the things I found absolutely astonishing was how many you know, women in their 20s, 30s, that sort of age group, um, were out there just, mm. just 
it was a dominant made with every concert, every restaurant, every place we went. Um, and my speculation on that would be this is really, we're really seeing the first generation where fully half of all college grads are female, where, you know, women are fully 50% of the intake of most professional organizations. Um, and I think, you know, they have, they have money to spend and the freedom to spend and they feel safe in what they're doing. And it, it was fascinating to see. Yeah. So everybody, we've got about 10 minutes before Sally and I are going to open it up for questions. So if you have questions, please be thinking about them, uh, put them in the chat and so forth. Um, so a couple, Sally, just to forewarn you are, um, you know, we're going to be thinking about how women can rise given the current yes. circumstance. Like what yes. If it's different, perhaps, than we would have before. Um, but, a, but a quick one was, you know, are, are we better off being unapologetic or Machiavellian? <laughs> or... <laughs> Machiave Machiavellian, no. But strategic. Mm -hmm. Strategic. There's a difference. We need to be strategic in how we think about our careers and what we want to contribute. And I find for women, they're often more comfortable in terms of thinking about contribution. And that's really what it is. You know, this is what I want to achieve or this is what I want to contribute. Um, so I work with the women that I work with always, whether it's in large groups or small groups, to be very intentional about how they think about what it is they have to contribute and what they want to contribute, how they're going to frame that, how they're going to talk about that, how they're going to use that to achieve acknowledgement and visibility and recognition, because we need recognition or we will disengage. It's very important to make sure we get recognition or we'll start to feel like, well, they'll never, they'll never appreciate me. I've interviewed hundreds of women who've left great jobs thousands and jobs that look good. And the most common thing I hear is they had no idea what I could do. So driving recognition for what you can do is, is an important part of, of engagement. It, it, it really, really is. And um, so, so being strategic in terms of thinking about that, that's not Machiavellian. Um, Machiavellian involves using people uh, this involves engaging people in trying to achieve something of contribution that you believe is worthwhile. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'm reminded uh, of saying this, of, of how some, sometimes people set goals. And a lot of times in my um, work, I'll run across somebody who's, and I'll say, well, you know, what, what's, what's, your, what's your aspiration? What's your vision for what you want to accomplish? And they'll say things like, oh, I want to be a level four, grade E, you know, North American, whatever, marketing leader. And, and, and sometimes people just get that so stuck in their heads that they can't get past it. And one of the things I find very interesting is when you really ask them to unpack why, you know, why do you want to do that? What, what is it about that role that intrigues you? And you'll get back things like, well, you know, I really want to have the authority to be um, able to bring people along that I think are important. I want to have the platform to express my ideas. I want to, in other words, there's all these things that this E4 level two, whatever it is, means to them. And I'm like, okay, well, look, let's keep that as something that you really want to prioritize. But that the E4 level two, whatever, that's one way of getting there. But there are many ways of getting there. And once yeah. you think about that, I think it changes your perspective on what trade-offs you're going to make and how you're going to um, do things. One last observation, um, and I don't know if she's with us now, but uh, one of my good friends is uh, Aviva Wittenberg-Cox, who's, as you know, yeah. done a lot of work. Mm -hmm. in the and she makes an interesting observation that sometimes the biggest barrier to women's advancement is the person she's sharing her home with. <laughs> because it's one thing to say, you know, yes, I support you and go for it, girl, you know, but then when it's a question of, well, I have to move for my job, it's a different story. Um, any sort of suggestions on navigating those treacherous waters? You know, it's such an important thing. I think we're more in the, um, in the situation that, uh, uh, agricultural people were uh, 150 years ago or 100 years ago in, in not just our country, but around the world, where your, your partner is really your life partner. And you need to choose intentionally someone that you can work this out with. 
So that's why it's helpful to be very intentional about what you want to contribute. And then you begin to build a support system that will help you make the contribution uh, that you make. And I think it's very important for young women to evaluate, um, to put that into the picture when they're thinking about who to partner with. Um, because we really need that. And Aviva, who I've known for 25 years, sure. is really, really right with that. You know, one of the things I published How Women Rise, Marshall and I, in, in, in early 2018, and it took off. And I've been on the road until a week and a half ago when I got off the road and probably will be for quite a while um, because I can't and everything was canceled. But you know, I've been on the road all the time. And one of the constant things I get is, doesn't your husband get upset that you're always gone? And I get this usually from men. Um, and uh, no, he's thrilled that I'm doing this. He supports it. And, you know, he makes it possible for me to do this by managing things here at home and and being available when when I need something. So that has been... I, it would be very hard to do this if every time I got an engagement, I were having to fight with him, as I know some people do, you know, no, I've got to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just, it's really important. It's going to be more and more and more important going forward um, as we have these sort of spiral careers as opposed to the straight line exactly. careers that we used to have. Exactly. And one of the things that Eva said, which I think is a, uh, very encouraging to people like me anyway, is that for many women, um, if you look at the whole life cycle, you know, yeah. you think about most organizations, right? They're built around a male life cycle. So yeah. in the 20s, you kind of figure out what you want to do. Your 30s, you get sorted into high potentials and everybody else. Your 40s, you're kind of taking the reins of power. Your 50s, you're allowed one major flame out with a blonde and a Ferrari. And then in your 60s, you sort of hand over to the next generation. And that just totally doesn't work for women's lives. Um, and so one of the things that I think is interesting is we're now seeing this absolute rise of women in their 50s, 60s, even 70s, um, who are discovering entirely new um, ways of, of expressing their uh, skills and ability. So um, before we turn to questions, um, what, what have we learned about being resilient in these times? What are some of the things that we should bear in mind as we face, you know, drastic change at work, changed assumptions about how we're going to make money, questions about how long is this going to go on? I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, a couple of weeks we'll be dealing with this. But when it starts to stretch into months and, and all indications seem to be this is not going to be over like next week. So we're in a new normal. Um, and what advice can we sort of take to heart about being resilient as we contemplate this? I think from what I've seen, and I look at the people who seem to be doing the best job here, uh, of coping, of managing, of, of finding ways to deal with it is we've got to be flexible. Um, we've got to take responsibility on for other people in a way that's, um, that's helpful. We need to be really clear about what, again, we intend to contribute and it can be in this crisis or not. Um, but most of all, we can't do this alone. And that's been one of the big lessons. And it's one of the major themes in How Women Rise is you can't do it alone. You need to, you need to engage others in helping you to achieve. Here's some ways to do it. And that's what I'm seeing is we can't do this alone. We need to engage in a more perhaps social um, way than we have been. Uh, that's, and that is fundamental to our resilience uh, to be able to do that, to have that support. We need support, we need flexibility, and we need, I, somebody yesterday on a phone call I was on said the most helpful thing to do here is to regard this crisis in chapters, not a book. So you're not racing ahead to the book. When is this going to end? Uh, how's it going to end, et cetera? We're in a chapter now and give it our full attention, give it the full intention of our full presence so that we can be alive to what it implies for how we can respond. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great advice. Um, a, a, a friend of mine who's the head of HR for a major, major pharmaceutical company mm -hmm. um, 
who went through a really difficult patch personally. She went through a bad divorce and, you know, of course, enormous pressures at work and in that field, you know, just everything's changing so rapidly. So it was a lot of intense pressure and she felt very alone. And what she did, which I thought was fascinating, was she created this posse for herself of other women in similar circumstances. Um, and she said what she was looking for was people who would call her up and say, you know, let's go to dinner. And she'd be like, oh no, I'm too busy. I'm too tired and whatever. No, 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 we're going to dinner. <laughs> you know, And just really watching out for each other um, because it's very easy, I think, um, especially in a senior role when you feel so much is on your shoulders. Um, you know, it's very easy to just go down that rabbit hole of forgetting that you need as much nurturing and as much help as, as others do. And that you're, you know, if you, if it's like, put your own mask on first, right? <laughs> um, and I think sometimes it's easy for people to uh, forget that. A couple of things I would add from the strategy side of things yeah. about resilience in a, in a time of, um, of change is um, what we know about resilient systems is they have some slack resources. Uh, yes. They have, uh, they have the ability to turn off parts of the system because you've built in some redundancy. Mm -hmm. um, and you've created, I'll call them um, um, uh, breakers, you know, circuit breakers almost, so that an alarm in one part of the system can be caught early and, and kind of shut down. And when I take that to, I mean, I believe that's true for organizations. And one of the big concerns I have right now is that we've forgotten that. You know, we've optimized and we've streamlined and we've made things so lean and so, you know, tightly coupled that um, we've sort of forgotten that you can, you can, build an entity for optimization, or you can build an entity for resilience, but the guiding principles are not the same. And uh, so personally, I think things like, you know, where are your pockets of resources that you could draw on if you need to? And, you know, make a list, make an inventory of, of what, what do you have to draw on? And those breakers, you know, when, when is it that you need to call a timeout? When is it that you just you know, you've gone down this road as far as you can, and now you need to stop and create some space for yourself. So I think there are things we can do proactively rather than just kind of wallowing in this um, situation. But I think it really does come down to this almost science of, of, of resilience. Um, That's brilliant, Rita. That's really that idea of slack resources and identifying these systems. And one of the most important is your various networks, your personal network, mm -hmm. your strategic network, your tactical network, all of them are going, you're going to need to engage them. Mm -hmm. That's a resource. Yeah. And you can be resources for each other. I mean, without this current crisis, but like in the past, I would have groups of young women all of us had kids, right? And and so there'd be a snow day and I'd have to teach that day. Well, you know, yeah. what do you do? Um, so my girlfriend who was gonna be staying home because her office was closed was like, oh, I'll watch your kids, you know? And so, and I would do the same for her if she was in some other kind of crisis. And so I think a lot of times we really can be resources for each other uh, along those lines. Yeah, well. um, so let's turn to some of the questions that have come in. Um, one was, so let's say you're making a contribution, you're doing a great job, you've accomplished fabulous things, but your boss still kind of doesn't appreciate that and uh, takes all the credit for your work. Any, any practical advice for that? You know, if your boss wants to take credit for your work in the organization, there's not much you can do about that. Um, you can make it very clear to him or her so that they know what you've done, but that's, that's something that you can't, say, oh, I did that, I did that, that you can't do that. What is within, so I'm very clear about distinguishing between what is in your circle of concern and what is in your circle of control and the more they're aligned, uh, the more effective you'll be. It is usually not within your control if your boss does that, although it's very much in your circle of concern. But what you wanna be, what is in your circle of control is the degree to which colleagues, for example, or peers or other people in the organization who aren't your direct boss, um, maybe getting credit for things you've done. And there, there you, you need to st step up and take initiative. Um, I think it's too often, you know, the, the classic example that you shared earlier of a woman being in a meeting and saying something and no one saying anything, and then a guy saying the same thing and everybody said, oh, what a great idea. Um, you know, the response you don't want to 
take there is to walk out of the meeting, grab another woman and say, can you believe that happened again? And sort of talk about it. it that, is, that does nothing to remedy the situation. Um, what can help is you know, either addressing it directly. Oh, I'm glad you like my idea. That's wonderful. Let's talk about it afterwards. You know, with a little humor. Um, or to engage people going into the room. You know, this has happened to me a number of times. And um, if you're comfortable, would you, you know, speak up? And if you're not, just notice, just see that it's happening. Because oftentimes people aren't aware and then you feel bad. And I would have thought so-and-so would have said something. He may not have noticed. He may be focused on his notes. So, you know, get more active in, in, but distinguish between that. You do have some control, but a boss who literally takes control for, uh, uh, takes um, credit for everything you do, there's not much you can do about that. So you need to think about where you are and who your boss is, but um, those are two different things. Um, so uh, Aviva is actually on our, on our call. Hi. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, and raises the question, which I think is a very valid one of, um, you know, this isn't really about fixing the women, right? It's about creating organizations where women's contributions can be um, um, accepted. Uh, not just accepted, where women's contributions matter, right? Where, where it's, where, where it's going to contribute to a performance. Um, and um, one of the questions that, that comes up a lot is how do we get men to get that, right? So, you know, I teach this women in leadership program and it's a whole room full of women talking to each other, which is great. And I think there's a time and a place where that really is wonderful. You know, it's just nice to be, you know, uh, um, sort of able to sort of let your hair down a little bit in, in a, in a non-judgmental environment, but that doesn't get at the immediate issue, which is, you know, for men, this is, um, and Aviva raises this issue of these sort of diversity and inclusion yeah. ghettos, right? Or women are in the R jobs, you know, HR, IR, legal, yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't have P&L jobs. Um, so how do we get, because, it, and, you know, as a strategist, I mean, this is a massive lost opportunity, right? And if I look at some of the most hilarious business flops, I, I study <laughs> Me too. Um, and, you know, a lot of them are rooms full of men making decisions about products and services that are mainly going to be sold to women. And it's like, of course you don't understand this. Like, why would you? <laughs> you know? Um, and there was a recent book, and I'm forgetting the author now, but uh, just going through the science of this and how women are literally dying because of products and services and assumptions made around serving only male populations. For example, one of the cases in the book was um, the symptoms of a heart attack in women are different than in men. And that women are often completely misdiagnosed because all of our medical experience is, is based on male kind of prototypes. Um, so I'd love some sort of high level thoughts on how do we, how do we get the male part of this equation to care? <laughs> Well, two things. Um, and I agree, of course, uh, with Aviva that, um, you know, structural and cultural constraints are primarily responsible for holding women back. And in addressing the habits and behaviors that get in women's ways, it was not because I felt that that was primarily, you know, it's women's fault that they haven't and if they could repair these behaviors. That's not what I think. Habits and behaviors lie within our control. And we don't have that much control over the larger culture and structure of our organizations until we are in positions of power. So part of what I, Marshall and I were seeking to do in How Women Rise is kind of, here's how to get out of your way so that you can assume a position with greater power in the organization. In my observation, organizations become more comfortable places for women to work, more cognizant of what women can contribute, and far better at addressing the real market needs of female clients when they have more women in senior leadership positions, all of which makes sense. So, so that's really, that's what I've spent 30 years trying to do is to help women to fulfill their greatest potential, to recognize, articulate, and then act on their greatest strengths. So 
I think that starting by identifying what could get in your way is a pretty good place to start. But it's not just to make yourself into this wonderful, fabulous, perfect person, which we you know, often are focused on. It's to get yourself into a position where you may be able to have, will be able to have more influence and power and begin to shift that general uh, culture. Enlisting men in a way that is helpful, powerful, and serves a greater resilience and brings more ideas into the organization is an essential part of that. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I mean, to me, some bright spots um, are, um, you know, when, when the head of Goldman Sachs says, we're not going to be part of any IPO with an all-male leadership team. I mean, you know, by the time you're putting money on the table, that gets people's attention. Um, you know, an another uh, that I think is, is a very promising uh, idea is this whole notion of, um, you know, how do you structure engagement so that real psychological safety, as Amy Edmondson talks yeah. about, yeah. allows people to genuinely make a contribution. And with the emphasis we've had in the last few years on innovation, uh, we're really seeing that, that, that people are starting to get that, you know, that if we don't have all the voices in the room, we can make terrible mistakes. And when I look at corporate blind spots, which is a big, <laughs> big theme of mine, um, you know, people knew, like, you know, and, and often people who weren't sitting at the table or who weren't being paid attention to, people knew. And, and yet the decision makers either chose not to listen, you know, got the message and chose not to yeah. pay attention to it, or just were, you know, not, not, not listening at all. Um, so what do you think, you know, if you put our crystal ball on, and this is Giselle Shelley who's asking this, uh, who is part of, our, um, part of our faculty for the Women in Leadership Program. Um, you know, what do you think is likely to be the consequence for diversity and inclusion if everybody's scrambling for survival? Uh, well, as noted, diversity is the nature of our workforce. Mm -hmm. And inclusion is the means by which a diverse workforce is effectively led. Uh, we're going to go through a time where because of massive downsizing, there's going to be probably less focus in organizations on you know, who they need to hire and train. So I think in terms of that, there will probably be some kind of impact on uh, the diversity in the workforce or the focus on being able to build a diverse workforce. Um, that will change because it's the nature of the workforce that global organizations have to work with now. Um, but in terms of inclusion, I think that, that this crisis can serve inclusive practices. And one of those inclusive practices, and we haven't talked about this, but I think it's really important, is that ability to recognize uh, women's strategic input. And you were talking about blind spots, and my friend uh, Margaret Heffernan uh, wrote a brilliant book called uh, Willful Blindness about the behaviors that um, serve, you know, serve organizations that, 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 that begin to crash. But I think one of the things, you know, when I wrote the book, The Female Vision, Women's Real Power at Work, I was influenced by a number of studies that showed that senior leaders tended to undervalue women as strategists, women as big picture thinkers. They saw them as effective communicators, negotiators, great at building relationships and engaging people, but were skeptical about women's strategic impulse, uh, abilities. And I thought, well, what is that about? Why is that perceived that way? And what I learned in doing research for that book is that it often has to do with, you know, what is your vision? Your vision is what, what you notice um, what you value about your notice and how you frame what you value about your notice. And women have a different, slightly different noticing capacity. They tend to notice a lot of things at once, as opposed to that sort of later laser-like focus on each next item. Now, that's what I call in the book, broad spectrum notice. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many values uh, there's great value in broad spectrum notice. Seeing around the corners is one of them, the capacity to see around the corners. So I think that there's a chance here uh, to, uh, if we can articulate it right, 
to have greater respect for the value of broad spectrum notice uh, and see that a laser-like focus, as in 2008, didn't serve us all that well, that we needed to notice other signs. Uh, and that will serve women's confidence in uh, conceiving of themselves as real strategic thinkers, mm -hmm. need to communicate in a, in a way that laser-like noticers can understand. But I think that, that the whole concept of the ability to see around the corners is going to become much more valued so that broad spectrum notice has a greater strategic role to play. Mm, that's that's an, that's that's very hopeful. Um, I'll add to that. Um, you know, we're in a moment of unfreezing where mm. a lot of the routines and habits and taken for granted ways that things have been done. You know, we've always done it this way. Uh, that's going to get unfrozen. Um, we're also, I think, in a moment where a lot of stuff that's perceived as non-essential is going to get thrown overboard. And so, I think if you're in the kind of organization where diversity and inclusion is, you know, a box to check or, oh, it's one of those things, you know, it's like, it's like, I don't know, uh, whatever, um, whatever the flavor of the day is, you know, years ago, it was, it was different things. Um, but I think when it comes to survival, um, and, and uh, my friend Tom Colditz talks about this, you know, Tom, and uh, he wrote a wonderful book called In Extremist Leadership. And what he talks about in the book is what he calls uh, danger professionals, you know, crisis professionals. And he says that when we think about what we've learned about crisis, that we tend to look at crisis amateurs. So these are people that got into trouble for whatever reason, and either they got their way out of it or they didn't. Um, and what he was interested in learning from was crisis professionals, people who very deliberately put themselves in harm's way. So people in the military, firefighters, um, you know, people doing dangerous kind of uh, exploration work. Um, and, and he was curious what they, uh, what they did that was different. And one of the most interesting things that he did was, that he observed was in a crisis, one of the first things these folks do is they lower the emotional temperature. So they say, you know, our vision of leadership is often somebody that's, you know, guns blaring, you know, fires rocking up, we're up on the mountain and over the barriers, men, you know, uh, and, but he said, that's not true at all. What you want to do is you want to lower the emotional temperature so that people are not in this kind of angst mode. Then what you need to do is, is get them focused on things that are outside themselves. So, you know, what I want you to do for, for this afternoon is take this pencil and move it from here to there. And you just focus on doing that for right now. Because what you've got to do is get people out of this, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, you know, mode into here's something very productive you can do. Uh, authentic communication. So I may not know what the ultimate answer is, but I think if you move this pencil from here to there, it'll take us in a positive direction. And I'll let you know when I know more. But one of the most important things he said was that the, the wartime, the leading in wartime, is you're depending on the kind of money in the bank that you built up in peacetime. And people need to trust that you have the competence to lead them out of these situations. And they develop that trust over you know, many repeated interactions. So here's a, a positive thought for what may come out of this crisis um, as we move toward wrapping up, which is a lot of women have a lot of money in the bank. They are trusted. You know, they're not seen as Machiavellian. They are not seen as political players. They're seen often as, as the sensible person in the room, you know, and, and I think those qualities could actually prove to be a tremendous advantage as organizations sort of thrash around and look at what they're going to be doing next. Because the kind of, you know, breastfeeding, um, I'm, I'm the, the you know, captain of the universe kind of behavior doesn't work in a crisis. It's not leadership in a crisis. Um, and I think... Mm -hmm. The positive side of all this is with all this unfreezing, we have the chance to remake organizations in a much more I think, positive direction. So um, let me let, let turn it over to you perhaps for the last minute or two and, and summarize, and then we'll thank everyone and um, conclude. Well, I think we've talked about a lot of really interesting things. We've talked about the change in how excellence in leadership is perceived. Uh, we've talked about how that's going to be influenced by the period we're living through, which we don't know, but I would guess, you know, given what you just said about Tom Colditz's model and this idea that we're unfreezing a lot of things, um, is going to be quite profound. Uh, and we've talked about resilience and what, what, what it takes to get through. Um, and, and 
I love the fact that we are sort of ending on your observations about competence and the connection between competence and the ability to build trust. Uh, because I think that women have gotten often a lot of discouragement. Well, she's really competent, but I'm not sure she, you know, is a risk taker or a big picture thinker. I think we will, she's got a nice personality. <laughs> I think we will have a greater, um, a greater trust and a greater need for competence. And that that may serve women very well because the, the crisis atmosphere here, not making it a book rather than chapters, but this is, this is gonna last a while. I would agree. But um, hopefully we'll all hang in there together. Um, I wanna thank you, Sally, for making the time and, and beaming in to us. I really appreciate it. Um, and to all of our visitors and guests, um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, how can people learn more? So learn more about um, the, the sort of uh, wider point of view or the vantage point? Are there resources you can point people to? Well, yeah, I think Amy Edmondson is essential reading in this environment. Absolutely essential. She writes about fearless organizations and I see a tremendous amount of overlap. I do urge people to read um, the T Tommaso from music, you know, why are there so many <laughs> incompetent male leaders? I think it's a great book. It's not an anti-men book at all. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, very powerful. And I think that's something people uh, could look at. And I do think, you know, th that it's an interesting time to revisit the female vision, mm -hmm. uh, women's real power at work about, you know, a women's strategic capacity and how that's undervalued, why it's undervalued and how to address that. Great. So um, I'll wrap up now because we're right at time. Uh, this has been recorded. We'll make sure that the links are made available. And there was a request that we send out a list of all the books that we mentioned, which we'll, we'll put to get that together. And uh, I'd love to get your feedback. We're talking about, you know, as we're all sort of huddled next to our virtual fireplaces, we're thinking about doing Friday fireside chats if this would be helpful to people. Just to, if nothing else, to get a break from whatever you're dealing with at home. Um, and uh, I'd love to hear from you and uh, keep in touch. So thank you, Sally. Thank you, Rita. A pleasure.